The game is actually really easy to teach, but we're, we're gonna have to work our way backwards through it. Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And today I'm reviewing Genotype from Genius Games, a game of Mendelian genetics as you try to get as many points as possible, manipulating these Punnett squares over here. And I'm gonna stop talking because I realize I might be diving into some of the potentially confusing terms depending on your familiarity with the, the, the science behind this game. And so let's take a step back, let's ignore that, and let's just dive into what you're doing here. I'm gonna try to avoid any terminology past, well, basic stuff. So, this is a game where you're trying to get as many points as possible. You're going to be playing across five rounds, trying to get as many points. Most of your points are going to come through these cards over here. These pea plant cards over here, where you're trying to get those plants. In order to do so, you're going to want to acquire these plants. It's a worker placement game, which means acquiring these plants means putting your worker down in one of the many worker placement spots on the board. In this case, placing over here, grabbing two cards from either the cards available or the top of the deck. Once you have those cards, they go into your hand. Then later, when you take another one of your workers and you put it down into your gardening square, you can go ahead and take any finished plants already and then place any new plants down that you're trying to score for. Fast forward a little bit later and we're going to be trying to draft dice. We're going to be drafting dice from various zones, looking at the specific uh, criteria for those zones. So for example, if we have a big F and a small F, if I take this die later, forget for a second how we get there, if I later take that die slotting into the spot, I can go ahead and cover up that big F little F. I've taken the required dice, I've covered up one of the criteria, one of the genetic aspects of the plant, and now we're one quarter of the way there. Different plants will have different indicators in them. This plant, for example, only requires two small Fs and two small Gs. Again, that'll be found over here, that'll be found over here. These are the genetic coding markers from a th mathematic point, but let's just focus on what we're actually doing. So you're gathering plants. Plants will score points based on the indicators on them. In order to get those plants, you're going to take a worker placement action. Then you'll take another worker placement action to put them down on your board. In the second part of the game, when we go through the dice drafting phase, we're going to gather dice based on the various genetic sequences of the various colors they are in, matching that combination of uppercase and lowercase letter to the specific plants, placing little markers on those to slowly indicate that they are done, and then later in a future gardening phase, when you once again go here to garden another time, you can go ahead and uproot or not uproot, uh, finish supplanting all the cards that are completed. So for example, I can go ahead and complete this plant over here, put it into my face down plants pile. That'll be giving me points at the end of the game and then plant any more plants I've acquired since then. That's a lot of the core engine. Now, there's a few other things I'll give you points. Those are worth knowing about, so let's talk about some of them. Again, worker placement, so it'll all be around that. You can go ahead and place a worker placement over here. You'll have to pay coins, either two or three coins to do so, but you'll set a research goal. What that means is you're going to go ahead and take one of your markers, and you're going to put it on one of these little markers here to get bonus points for every time that feature appears in your card. You can look for the actual physical feature, or you can just match the letters. So, for example, if you have this one over here, you're looking for small R's on your card. If I compare the card I've already done and I compare the card I have over here, they don't really have a lot of commonality, but they do have one thing in common, which is going to be the uh, the, t the the t big t the big double big t over here. So, for example, if I go over here and I do the tall plant, this one over here has the double big t. This one over here additionally has the double big t. You can see the artwork indicator as well. There's gonna be different p's. There's gonna be different stems over here. The flowers, the colors. Again, you can look visually or just at the letters. And if I complete both these cards at the end of the game, that'll give me an extra four bonus. Bonus points, and that's going to be true across the board for all the various features you can find over there. That's primarily what you're doing to score points. You're placing your workers, you're going to be gathering cards, you're going to be trying to plant those cards through a dice drafting phase that takes place after the worker placement phase, and then you're trying to do so as efficiently as possible with a whole bunch of other fun things we haven't talked about. What are those other fun things? Well, let's go through the various worker placement spots so you have a better idea of how they all work. Up here, you can go ahead and take two money. Now, many zones will have a four-player limitation, so you want to take that into account as you go. But over here, we have two money that you can gather over here. At the university, you have to pay money in these spots, but you can immediately put down one of these tokens on any spot. If you're having trouble finishing a card, getting that last spot in, or you have three spots of a card done, but you want to finish it before you go gardening, well, this will give you the opportunity to do that mid the worker placement round, as opposed opposed to waiting for the dice placement round, you could follow that track over here. We have worker placement, we have dice placement, you have the uh, the upgrades, which we haven't talked about, and then the resetting of the board. So that will be these spots here, these spots here. Over here, you can go ahead and gather more cards from the nursery. So that's going to be gathering cards, uh, two face-up cards or face-up or from the top of the deck. Over here in the tool shed, you'll have the opportunity to go into one of these spots over here, and you'll be gathering a variety of tools that will give you some sort of impact in the game. 
We have something like the watering funnel over here, which straight up again gives you another one of those things that will cover one of those icons. Then you have other things that will potentially make more sense as we talk about this here. So let's just say that the tool shed gives you a lot of fun things, and we'll come back to some of these and explain them over here. Setting research goals is going to be two spots here, paying two or three money to do so, and those will allow you to try to get additional goals. Helpful early game to get them before other players do, but also helpful late game because that's when you have a little bit more money flexibility, because early game you're going to want to save some of your money for the upgrades over here. And then some of the confusing aspects that we'll touch upon shortly are going to be these spots over here. Now, before we talk about those spots over there, we're going to skip that. We'll come back to what these spots over here mean, but it'll make more sense if we pretend they don't exist for a second. So let's pretend they don't exist for a second. When you're done placing all your little workers, these little gardening spades over here, when you're done placing all of those and all the players are done, you're going to go to the dice drafting phase. What that means is you're going to go ahead and you're going to roll these dice. You're going to roll these dice... And then you're going to do this for each of the colors, and you're going to place them in the specific grid that the Punnett Square outlines. So we can see a 2 over here is a cross-section of a big T and a small T, which means 2s will go to this section over here. We have these 4s. Those 4s are going to be small T, small T, so they'll go over here. And the 1 is big T, big T. That will go over there. An additional option is we could have rolled some of these symbols over here. When you roll those, and there's 2 of them, but when you roll those, you'll re-roll. And if you get it again, you'll put it down in that spot. So it has to land there twice, but if you do do so, it'll land in this spot over here, and that's a grid filled. You're going to do this so for each of those grids over here. Let's go ahead and do that. We're going to put the X's, the X's will re roll. We'll see what happens. We got no X's. The four is going to go big, big G, small G, big G. We have the I in here, and I'm not going to do more of these. I'll just call this a day over here big, big G, small G. And there we go. We have all those lined out, and we'll do so for all of those over there. And when you're done with that, in turn order, players will draft dice. You're going to draft dice from any of the four zones, trying to be mindful of the specific cards you're going for, and trying to make sure you get your hands in them, both based on what you want and based on how many dice there are. So for example, I want a big G, small G die, but there's three of them. There's a decent chance it'll be there when it comes back to me, so I'm going to skip that for a second and focus on the small G, small G, of which there's only one. I'm going to grab that die, I'm going to slot it, I'm going to cover my small g, small g over there, ta-da, awesome. Other players will go ahead and draft, someone will take this, someone will take that, it's back to my turn, I can grab this big g, big g, small g over here, cover that over there, excellent, and then over here, I'm now done, I've grabbed my three dice. Technically one was there from a few minutes ago, but I have had my three dice over here, I'm done, you have three dice slots that you can place your dice. Now it's worth noting that earlier in the game, one of the places you could have gone is you could have gone over here, these spots over here, which open up temporary dice slots for you. These temporary dice slots will allow you to take extra dice when it comes to the dice drafting phase, which is perfect because I would love to grab one of those. This is going to be one of the ways you can gather money in the game, so I'll go ahead and take that one money. Money is going to be very useful. Alternatively, Another use for the de novo dice over there is if you have enough room for them, you can take a de novo dice, you can grab another dice, and choose any of the aspects, basically considering it a while to an extent, which is helpful for getting that specific die that you want to match one of your cards, but it does mean you have to use two slots up for it, which is a big cost to ask. So I'm not going to do that right now, I'm just going to grab that single money, put it over here, great, that's the dice drafting phase. Right about now, you should have a good idea of how this entire board works over here, because we've covered all the spots. You still don't know how these spots work over here, or this over here. These are the first shift, first shift, second shift, and the manipulation of the Punnett Squares options over here. Let's talk about the first shift and second shift first. If doing the first worker placement phase, we had gone ahead and placed, let's say, this player over here, if they had placed one of their spots over there, doing that spot, because there's a money here, if they if there was money there, I should say, they will take that money. They'll be able to grab the money because they're the first place, person to place in green from either of these two options, and they take the money that's there. Basically, all the columns of colors over here, all the rows of colors, give you a potential opportunity to get your hands on one money. But additionally, when it comes time to dice draft, they have first dibs on any dice. You're going to look at each row that has a potential marker, and you're going to give that person who has a marker in that row the opportunity to take one die and remove their marker before the dice draft begins. That die will count against the number of dice they are allowed to draft, but it's effectively a way of circumventing turn order and getting first dibs, which can be huge, to actually ensure you finish the right cards. Second shift is going to be something similar, although slightly different. When all the players are done taking their first shift pick, any players in second shift can have the opportunity to take one die from anywhere, again, removing their marker, circumventing turn order. Not as powerful as first shift. You don't get money. You don't get first dibs. Perhaps some flexibility and perhaps useful if other players have gone on these spots already and you're still trying to circumvent second place if not first place. 
That's what these spots over here are doing. Lastly, we have these spots over here, which are a huge part of the game, but you kind of have to understand everything else that's happening for that to make sense. When you place a worker over here, once again, if there is a money in that color, you will take that money. But then additionally, you will have the opportunity to adjust the Punnett square over here, manipulating what comes out over there. You can change these up. So for example, I can go ahead and I can put this down over here, making it more likely that we will have big T's doubling up over here. There's now a 50% chance of those big T's occurring as opposed to the previous 25% chance that there was. You are effectively adjusting the grid so that now when you roll the dice, you're going to compare it to the grid and the one is a big T double T, which it was before to be fair, but if any threes had been rolled, we would have had adjusted those outcomes on the grid. You have the opportunity to manipulate this even further because of the fact that you have these at the same time. So you have all these different options. Now we have everything's big T's. It's big T's all around over there. So you have the opportunity to manipulate how the dice will roll, which can be very helpful, especially if you already have cards lined up that will benefit from those aspects and other players have cards lined up that will not. From there, when you're done with all that, when you're done with the worker placement in which you'll have taken the, the first shift, the second shift, the money, the cards, the tool sheds, all these things, let's talk about this rake over here. This rake, just to give an example of a tool card, gives you the opportunity to, when you take a die, you can cash in this tool in order to convert a die to any aspect. Similarly, this graph knife over here will allow you to, when you take a die, take two dice at once and put the extra die on this card. These are all one-time use abilities, but they can be very helpful now that you have a slightly better idea of what's going on over here. So, you place your workers, you get your abilities, you go through the full dice drafting phase, you draft as many dice as you're able to hold based on the abilities you have, based on extra things you've bought, and then we move to the upgrades, which is where you can buy some of those extra things. In the upgrade phase, in reverse turn order, you're going to have players having the opportunity to buy upgrades at the listed price. There's four upgrades, four opportunities for how you're going to upgrade your tableau in genotype. You have the new plots over here, which are going to be cards. These new plots over here, they go to the left of your player board and they give you another planting space. They can be very useful, especially when combined with some abilities that I'm not heavily going to get into, but they give you flexibility and they can be very useful when combined with certain abilities. You have the dice slots. Dice slots are similarly going to be spots where you can put extra dice. Tired of only drafting three dice per round? Excellent. Buy a dice slot. You'll be drafting more dice throughout the course of the game. And every time someone buys one of these, you're going to move the marker up. So as people buy things, they get more expensive. Don't worry, the price can come down too. In the action marker over here, players have the opportunity to spend money to take an extra action marker, effectively an extra worker that you can utilize in the round. And then lastly, we have hiring assistants where players will have the opportunity to hire any of the assist these assistants over here. This is gonna be three per round and they'll come out new ones each round and they give you potentially game breaking abilities in different ways. Over here, we have brother, uh, brother Leopold who is going to lower the cost of anything you spend money on by one to a minimum of one, so there is a catch over there, but you can make everything cheaper, and as a first round pick, this can be hugely impactful. That will have allow you to buy all the upgrades the rest of the game for a smaller price, and the upgrades are freak infrequently at one anyways, so you're getting the full benefit of Brother Leopold over there. That's basically going to be the upgrade phase. When that's done, we go to cleanup, where we're gonna clear some card rows, replace some of these uh, assistants over here, as well as moving these dice slots one down. So they're all, all coming down a little bit, unless of course they were bought, in which case they're just settling back to where they were. Players have the opportunity to buy as many upgrades as they want, or more specifically, as many as they can afford, because affordability is going to be key. Rinse and repeat for five rounds across that until you get to the end of the game. Add up all your points from all the various pea plants you've uh, finished, as well as the various upgrades and bonuses you have, and that is Genotype. That's a lot of information to go through, but at the same time, this game is actually really simple, but not immediately intuitive, especially because of the scientific aspect behind it, which is why I wanted to go into detail on all of this, which brings us to the review part of things, starting off with ease of play. The rules are actually fairly easy to go into. The rules are fairly easy to, to understand as you go through it, and the game is, is medium easy to teach. Especially if you're familiar with general game mechanics, there's a lot of overlap in this game that is stuff that are familiar to people that will make this game approachable and easy to teach. Some of the aspects, especially the way the dice drafting works and the nature of the randomized pool of what you will be drafting and how that interplays with your cards, I do find that it helps to teach it the way I just did over here by kind of approaching, here's how you win, here's the action sequence, here's part of the worker placement, here's what will happen during the dice placement, and here let's explain again what happens for the rest of the worker placement. I find that makes the game a little easier to to understand as you kind of separate the phases up to make the parts of the worker placement understandable. So while the game is mostly easy to teach, 
a few shortcuts of far, as far as the sequences I would normally teach a game in. As far as table space, it's, well, pretty small, and as far as game time, I would say that maybe your first game will be a bit longer, but after that, this settles in comfortably at under an hour, perhaps differently at the five players. I have not played this at five players. It's a one to five player game, but at three to four players, this game consistently is under the hour mark once you get past that first game or two. Speaking of which, as far as player count, this is a one to five player game. Uh, I believe it's best at three and four. Two, it doesn't really operate as well. Five, it gets a little cluttered and solo mode I haven't played at all so I can't speak to that but in general three and four players are going to be the best player count for this slight preference towards three but uh, both are rated fairly well on board game geek as far as what I like don't like and can see others not liking the advisors are a lot of fun that's easily my favorite part to begin with. The advisors over here, all of them, well, most of them give you slightly game-breaking abilities. Slightly game-breaking, I guess it's not the same thing as game-breaking, but they give you powers that are cool. Blocking and blocking and Brother Leopold over there can be incredibly helpful early game to make everything cheaper. Over here, we have, uh, we have uh, Father Edward, who's going to give you a free extra spot where you can put your plants, where you can put your pea pods, but... The flip side is, this is even better than extra slot in the sense that it will constantly refill. As soon as you gather it, you're going to put one down, and every time you finish it, you'll be able to put down more of them. So not as much control as you traditionally want over them, but saves you a lot of actions while giving that flexibility. We have over here, we have Father Father Omari over here, who has an interesting action where he's going to give you a worker placement zone, which means it costs a worker to use him, even after you've gotten him, but when you do so, you'll roll dice every single round when you do that, and you'll look at the specific grids that they line up of based on the current punnet squares, and you'll have the opportunity to potentially get as many as four spots covered up. It helps if you have more cars and more plants to make sure that you are more likely to have spots to cover up, but he can be huge, giving you for a single worker placement and no cost, four spots covered up. A little bit of the luck of the dice involved, but incredibly impactful. And they don't get any worse over here. We have consistently, we have tons of cards over here that are just a lot of fun. One of my favorites over here is going to be Sister May. Sister May is going to allow you to, whenever you take a spot, you can put your things down on all the exact matching, matching sequences. So all your big F, small Fs, you'll be able to lock all of them at once whenever you take a big F, small F. That's actually a card that's fairly common in the tool shed. It's one of those cards that's very common. But the pollen brush is a one-time use, and Sister May is all the time use. You get her early game. Well, early game she's actually not as powerful because she really starts to shine when you have three, four, five plant systems going, so you can just fully manipulate and take advantage of her. But you can find potentially game-breaking combos in the ways you build out your grid, in the ways you gather dice slots, in the way you gather more plant slots, in the way you gather your, your assistance, and the way you ba gather more action markers. Every single one of the upgrades is key. The upgrade phase every single round, or the upgrade phase, the first three rounds of the game, are incredibly fun, and they're very impactful in the way they implement that. And the pathways towards victory in this game are also significant in the way you can choose different upgrade paths, or build up different trees, or pursue different strategies. Going heavily on a few cards, but locking in all the bonuses, especially if it means cutting other people out of theirs, although you're limited to a few, so you can't completely lock people out, but you can lock some people out, especially if not everyone's focusing on them as much. There's a lot of things you can do. Get the right bonuses when other players haven't focused on them. If someone's not focusing on the white flowers, they may only have one or two. So quickly lock out other bonuses. There may not be options left to them. Grab the right tools, take the right slots, manipulate these spots over here, manipulating the punnet squares to take advantage of the fact that you will benefit from the new coordinates of what you've put out, and the other players aren't prepped for that and will have to spend, start spending wild resources or going to the university. There's a lot of opportunities of the things you can do with the game and the depth to game time, the amount of stuff going on in this fairly accessible work placement engine that plays in under, under an hour and is very tight at the same time, there's a lot of fun things going on in Genotype. At the same time, there are some things I don't like. The, the rolling dice aspect over here to match up to the Punnett squares every single round is a bit tedious. It's not a big complaint, mind you, it's just it's a nitpick, but it's something that does interrupt the flow of the game. Since every single round, you're going to have players rolling dice and then kind of looking and double checking that goes here. This is big T double T. Actually, this grid's fairly easy because I've made it all big T double T, so it's all big D double T. We're going to re-roll that. It gets another one of those. Perfect. But this is an anomaly because of the way we stack this. For the most part, you're matching up to a grid, you're slotting those out, it does help if other players have their hands in the pot and are helping you roll dice, but it's a little not as obvious. It's not as simple as rolling a dice and then choosing where it goes based on what the die face looks like. You have to match it up to a grid and look back. Again, not the end of the world, slightly irritating at the same time. 
My bigger issue is the upgrades start to get significantly less useful the further you go into the game, which is always the case in games like this, but there's a heavy drop off every single round. The upgrades the first round, when you also coincidentally can't afford much, the upgrades the first round are incredibly impactful. You'll only be able to pick one, maybe two if you're really aggressive and get lucky, but those upgrades are going to last you for five rounds of play, or four rounds of play technically, because the first round's already over, but that could be huge. That extra die that you just paid for will give you multiple payoffs over the course of the four rounds. That assistant you hired can be game-breaking, especially as you combo it with other things. The second round of play, they're still amazing. The third round of play, you're down to having only two rounds left at this point. You already have half the benefit, you're paying the same price, half the benefit. At this point, your money's better spent elsewhere, and the assistants start to lose their allure. The action markers, the dice slots, the cards, the new plots of cards, they all lose their allure at round three, and at round four and five, it practically becomes a dead market. I'm not saying no one's buying anything, well, round five, no one's buying anything. Round four, it's close to a dead market. Round three, it's significantly less interesting. Round one and two, is really where it shines. So two fifths of the game have the upgrades and the rest of it is capitalizing in on those upgrades. Not the end of the world, but it feels a little frustrating to have fun cards come out that aren't really worth the payoff. And then lastly, getting certain upgrades, getting certain advisors specifically early game can be significantly impactful. System A is an interesting one because System A is arguably the most powerful. I say arguably because I never like calling games broken that I haven't played like 30 times. System A is arguably the most powerful card in the game, but she doesn't shine round one necessarily. Versus Brother Leopold, getting his discount round one means you can get a lot more upgrades for a lot cheaper for the entire rest of the game. And that's a big deal, especially you combine the luck of getting Brother Leopold round one and perhaps System A round two and being able to buy those plots of lands and really cash in it. You can have crazy combinations that are a lot of fun for the person who has them, a little bit less fun for the people who never even have the chance to make that choice just based on the turn order circulation. As far as I can see others not liking, luck is absolutely a factor across the game. This one doesn't bother me because I find it tends to average out, but you're going to be rolling dice. And I've had multiple times where a player locks in a selection, hoping to get that double T that they need, or even the single T, and then someone rolls dice, and it's all going into this slot here. I'm not actually checking the grid, I'm just saying it, it works out that you all go into a slot that is statistically unlikely. That will happen, and fortunately there are opportunities of things you can do to hopefully mitigate that, but sometimes you can place your first shift card over there, and still get nothing. Luck is absolutely a, a factor in the game, not a big deal, but certainly present. And then secondly, I'd say that if you're not familiar with the background of genetics, of what's going on into these Punnett squares, of how those operate, then to a certain extent, these scientific aspects that make this a very educational game and a very solid addition to the gaming space in the combination of both the general game and the, the scientific, the educational aspect behind it, but those elements can actually make the game slightly harder to teach if you don't know what's going on. So while it does have the opportunity to be educational at the same time, it can be a barrier to entry as much as it is interesting. Again, I have to kind of break up the flow and sequence of how I teach the game just because of how well it is incorporated. And it is incorporated well, perhaps slightly detrimental to the pure elegance of what the game is trying to do. As far as final thoughts on Genotype, there's a lot of good going on here with some mixed feelings around it at the same time. Genotype is a quick playing game. It's fairly easy to teach, fairly easy to dive into, gives you a bunch of opportunities as far as the different ways you can explore the system, the different ways you can build your assistance, your action markers, your dice slots, the different pathways forward. Trying to go for a strategy in which you just load up on dice slots can give you a lot of flexibility but so can all the other opportunities you have. The tool cards are a lot of fun. The assistants are even more fun. Just trying to figure out the ways you can get the right patterns of plants. If you could actually get your hands on these three plants and lock in the three points extra for every yellow pea pot over there, that'll be nine extra points. In a game which the points can range between 50 and 70 points or 50 and 80 points, nine extra points with a few bonuses and perhaps more if you've gotten more cards, those can be incredibly impactful. There's a lot of fun ways to explore genotype. At the same time, some of my favorite aspects of the game start to get a little boring after you hit round three. Round three. You start moving away from a tableau building experience and into just kind of executing on what you did the first two rounds. And you play this a few more times and that, that, that allure, the shine of the various elements it has going on, does start to decline a little bit. It's still a solid game, it's still a great accessible game, but it's one that I find is really, really good in some areas, 
but also the shininess, the things that make it stand out, the things that make it different. Some of those elements are, have worn off for me after multiple plays. This one's a 3.5 out of 5 for me. I really like it. I think it's a solid game. It wowed me more for the first few games than it did as I dove into it more. But all around, Genotype is a solid game that I can easily recommend, especially considering the educational tie-in that Genius Games tends to do in a lot of their games. Solid educational tie-in in a way that doesn't come across as pasted on. It comes across as genuinely intertwined with what the game is doing. As far as other game recommendations, first of all, Shadow Kingdoms of Valyria. Shadow Kingdoms of Valyria has a similar feeling to what this game is doing. Very, very different, but a similar feeling with a more traditional theme as opposed to what this is doing, but a more traditional kind of medieval fantasy goblin trope kind of game, but in which you're going to be drafting dice in a game that is roughly the same game weight, roughly the same accessibility, quick, fast-paced turns in which across multiple rounds you're going to be building up your tableau while gathering dice and going through a dice placement sequence. Many elements are different, but it gives me a very similar gameplay feeling as far as what, Genius, uh, as far as what Genotype is doing. And then secondly, Cytosis a cell biology game from the same publishers. They have a bunch of other educational games and Cytosis is another one from them that has generally been well received. I have not played that one, so I can't comment overly on it, but Cytosis from Genus Games as well. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you found this video helpful, and as always, have a good one.